everybody! Today's practice problem comes from Essentials of Economics, second edition, by Paul Krugman, Robin Wells, and Catherine Grady. Today we're going to be doing chapter 3, problem number 11. I chose this problem specifically because it's kind of near and dear to my heart. Actually, I study the economics of the music industry, so I always like when I see a practice problem that has to do with the music industry. So the beginning of the problem reads as follows. In Rolling Stone magazine, several fans and rock stars, including Pearl Jam, were bemoaning the high price of concert tickets. One superstar argued, it just isn't worth $75 to see me play. No one should have to pay that much to go to a concert. Assume this star sold out arenas around the country at an average ticket price of $75. We see that pretty frequently with the bigger players in the music industry, so it seems like a pretty realistic scenario. Part A of the question asks, how would you evaluate the argument that ticket prices are too high? So we can think about the argument of, well, what defines a price that's quote unquote too high? What do people generally mean by that? And what do economists hear when they hear phrases like the prices are too high? As you've probably learned in your economics courses by now, economists tend to take a very value neutral judgment towards prices, that they don't tend to see prices as good or bad, and so on and so forth. And that's a little bit different from how people in general tend to think about prices. And economically speaking, a price is really only too high if it results in a surplus, if it results in not all of the good being sold, right? Conversely, a price would be what economists would call too low if it created a shortage of the product. So if we're going to evaluate this statement, is that our ticket price is really too high in a logical sense or a rational sense. Let's look at some of the information that we have. We were specifically told that the star sold out arenas around the country at an average ticket price of $75. So we can model that using a supply and demand diagram. And uh, to be fair, I've taken a few liberties in coming up with some supply and demand diagrams here. Mostly because if we're talking about a particular music superstar, we're not really talking about a competitive market. A competitive market is a market where there are a bunch of small suppliers basically selling identical products. And I don't think anyone would really reasonably say that Pearl Jam and the Rolling Stones and U2 and Mumford and & Sons and all these large groups are not literally perfect substitutes, right? That they're differentiated in some way. So technically speaking, we're not being totally accurate when we're just representing this with supply and demand curves. That said, the point still holds and we still get somewhat of a reasonable analysis here. And you'll notice that I drew two supply curves here. The supply curve on the left just represents this possibility and represents the fact that once a musical artist decides to play a particular venue, the quantity of tickets available for that venue is basically fixed, right? That it's not like, oh, if we're getting a higher price, we're going to release more tickets or something like that. Once a decision of venue and the number of shows is chosen, supply is what we would call perfectly inelastic. So one option to model this particular scenario would be something like this. On the other hand, we could say, well, technically speaking, if an artist could get a higher ticket price, that would serve as an incentive to actually play more shows and so on and so forth. And if that's true, then we might actually see a supply curve that's upward sloping like this here. And regardless of how we draw it, we're still going to be making roughly the same points. I just wanted to make sure that we put a scenario up that made intuitive sense, right? But you'll notice in either case, I labeled this $75 as our P star, as our equilibrium price. And of course, that's making the assumption that yes, the artist sold out the show at an average price of $75. By putting this as, as, at the equilibrium price, I actually made the assumption that there was no excess demand at that price, that everybody who was willing to pay for a ticket at that price was actually able to get one. Because we say that this economic equilibrium is the price at which everybody can get what they want at that price 
what they're willing and able to pay for, and there's none of it left over. And similarly, I labeled $75 as the equilibrium price over here. If this artist sold out the concerts and there were people that wanted tickets that couldn't get them, it would even be the case that this $75 would be somewhere below the intersection of the supply and demand curve. So I just assumed that it was here to make a reasonable starting point. So we can think about this idea of too high. Well, in an economic sense, this price isn't too high because people are willing and able to pay this price for the quantity of output that the artist is willing to supply. And one thing that's important to keep in mind about markets is that, you know, fair or not, prices act as a rationing mechanism. So prices are the thing, you know, higher prices curb demand, they incentivize supply and so on and so forth, and they bring supply and demand into balance. And if you take that value neutral stance of just saying, oh, well, the prices are just rationing so that we're bringing into balance the number of things available and the number of people who are willing and able to buy that thing, then this $75 actually seems pretty reasonable, right? And the other thing to notice is that the, uh, that the musician says, it just isn't worth $75 to see me play, which is an interesting statement because in economics, we don't really judge people's preferences. We just take them as given. Sometimes we judge whether they're rational or consistent or whatnot, but we're not trying to tell people how much they should be willing to pay for something. So this artist is not really, if you think about it, in a place to say what his mu music is worth, that it's up to the market to decide that. And apparently the market has decided that he's wrong and that his product that he's putting out there is in fact worth at least $75. Part B of the question says, Suppose that due to this star's protests, ticket prices were lowered to $50. In what sense is this price too low? And then it just says draw a diagram using supply and demand curves to support your argument. Well, we've already done that, so we can just think about how we would add to these diagrams to incorporate the situation that we're talking about. So this star wants to say, let's bring the price down to $50. And we can mark that here. That a price of $50 would be about something here. And what we would notice is that at this price, our quantity supplied of tickets was still the same, right? Because again, if we have a fixed size of stadium, then the lower price is not actually going to lower the number of tickets available. But what we do see now is that the demand for the star's performance at this price exceeds the supply. And we could say that the quantity supplied, of course, is at this level here, but the quantity demanded is out here. And we get what we call in economics a shortage. So this shortage represents the people who go online to Ticketmaster or whatever, and they're willing to pay what the tickets cost, but they put in their information and they get the little capture thing and they type it in, and they're like, sorry, there are no more tickets available for this event. We can also label a similar thing over here. Now, we can ask ourselves which situation seems more reasonable given the, um, given the problem setup. Here, again, we can show that at a price of $50, this artist, whether, you know, whether he realizes it or not, is actually lowering his incentive to play shows, right? That he might, maybe even without realizing it, say, oh, well, these shows aren't as profitable to me, so I'm going to do fewer of them. And that would actually just compound the problem, right? Because you'd have the quantity demanded all the way out here. And again, you'd have a shortage. And this shortage becomes particularly interesting because ticket sales are one place where we have pretty well-developed, well-functioning secondary markets. And by secondary markets, I mean StubHub, for example. So what's likely to happen is not necessarily that the price is lowered to $50 and some people get the tickets and then others are left out in the cold. What's likely to happen is that at least some of these tickets that are bought at a price of $50 
are put up on set on websites for secondary markets and sold at higher prices. So it may be the case that because this shortage gives an incentive to push prices higher, that despite this artist's best intentions, we might still see the price ending up back near this $75, or at least some of the people paying a price that's pretty close to this $75. The difference, of course, then being, first of all, if we're going to look at this model, the artist didn't get the $75 rather than the $50, so they didn't have a, an incentive to produce more. We're still stuck at this level of supply here. But also, as a customer, thinking about market dynamics, would you rather pay $75 to the artist or $50 to the artist and $25 to a ticket scalper? So the market forces that exist in this particular industry don't really allow these shortages to persist in the way that they might in other markets. And here, you can think about what might happen if the lower price is actually causing the artist to supply fewer tickets in the aggregate, it could actually be the case that if this is the number of tickets that's supplied, the ticket scalpers might actually jack up the price all the way to up here. So the rock star might actually be unknowingly, by trying to lower the price, might actually end up raising the price instead, which is the opposite of what he was intending. In an economic sense, of course, this price of $50 is too low simply because it's causing a shortage, that it's below the price that would bring the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded together and would allow everybody who is willing and able to purchase a ticket at that price to get one. Interestingly, there are a number of artists that, again, very well-intentioned try to make this happen to varying degrees of success. So, for example, Right now, Kid Rock is trying to guarantee that there will be tickets at a price of, I think, $20 available for all of his shows. And that case is interesting because he's not making all of the tickets available for $20. Maybe it's the, the seats that are further away, things like that, but he's very committed to having an affordable price point. And then if the artist is going to do that, if they're going to purposely price below the market equilibrium, there are a couple of things that they need to keep in mind. First they probably want to think about how to curtail these secondary markets because otherwise we're just going to end up back where we started but giving money to a third party rather than to the artist. And for example, Louis C.K. is very good with his comedy shows at curtailing those secondary markets and having requirements that you have to show your ID with the ticket that you purchased and things like that and really being hard on people who try to resell the tickets for profit. And we see some of that behavior happening but even when the artists are vigilant about preventing ticket scalping, as it's colloquially known, obviously, it's still worth noticing that even if they were able to maintain this price of $50, they're helping some people in that you have some people that would have paid $75 that now only have to pay $50. But they're also hurting some people in that now those people get sort of a false hope of being able to get the product at that price and then they try to go and get it and they learn to their dismay that it's no longer available. In addition, we might even have a situation where you have a person who would have happily paid $75 but at a price of $50 can't get the tickets because they're all gone because someone who wouldn't have paid the $75 bought the ticket first. And that's why when you have prices that are below the equilibrium, we can say that that's economically inefficient because we actually haven't guaranteed that the product is going to the people who value it the most. Part C of the question says, suppose Pearl Jam really wanted to bring down ticket prices. Since the band controls the supply of its services, what do you recommend they do? Explain using a supply and demand diagram. What we can see here, and we've talked about before, that there are two ways that an equilibrium price, not a forced out of balance price, can be lowered. We can either decrease demand for a product or we can increase the supply of the product. Now, like we said before, Pearl Jam doesn't really have a whole lot of control about how much demand there is for their product. 
you know, if they're going to make another album, they can make it totally suck or something. But for their existing output, they're not really in control of how much people want it. So all they can really control is the supply side of the market. So one thing that they could do if they were really committed to keeping ticket prices low is that they could actually put out enough quantity in the market to satisfy demand at that lower price because then there wouldn't be the pressure on market forces to push the price up above that amount. So here, if we were thinking about this model of perfectly inelastic supply, what they could do is they could look at, make an estimate of how many people would want to purchase tickets at a price of $50, and that they could make sure that they're either playing the size of venue or the number of shows that would make this $50 the new equilibrium price. So we could say here, if they increase supply, that this would be our old equilibrium price with the old supply, and that this would be our new equilibrium price with the new supply. Similarly, we could say over here, if they were responsive to price in some way, that they could increase their supply at each given price such that this $50 was actually an equilibrium price. And then you could see here there's no pressure to push prices above that $50 because everybody who's willing and able to pay $50 can actually get a ticket. And again, we could call this P1 star and this P2 star. So that would typically be the economist's advice for an artist who wanted to keep ticket prices down and had that specific incentive. And interestingly enough, there seem to be a number of artists that, with economic training or without, I'm not really sure, seem to have actually figured this out. For example, the band LCD Sound System had its farewell set of shows. They were supposed to have the shows at Madison Square Garden. And they vastly misestimated the level of demand for their shows, and they sold out very quickly. But they sold out very quickly because the ticket scalpers had anticipated the level of demand, and it bought up a lot of the tickets, and then we're selling them at higher prices. And the band got really mad. And they said, well, we can't control that directly. Your market forces are surprisingly powerful, right? So we can't control the demand side. We can't control that aspect. But what we can do is flood the market with shows to put those ticket brokers or those ticket scalpers out of business, or at least, you know, for this particular event, make them unprofitable. And actually, this is exactly what they did. They said, fine, you're going to play that game. We're going to book a whole bunch of new shows, not at Madison Square Garden, unfortunately, because it was already booked, but at a venue called Terminal 5 in New York. And they said, fine, we're going to increase supply so that everybody want, that wants to go can go with the face value of that ticket price. And the scalpers are going to be left holding tickets that they can't make money on. So they actually did figure this out, and this actually is something that happens in practice for artists who are concerned about keeping ticket prices low. Part D of the question says, suppose the band's next CD is a total dud. Do you think they would still have to worry about ticket prices being too high? Why or why not? And then again, draw a supply and demand diagram that explains what's going on. So we can think about what's happening here. And if the band's new CD was terrible. Now, we've seen this in practice. You know, I went to a Bon Jovi concert a number of years ago, and seriously, nobody gave a crap about the new stuff, but they were there all to see the songs like from the 80s, you know, Living on a Prayer, stuff like that, right? And literally, the crowd like went silent, was like, is this over yet? And then when they had something that they recognized, they were all, woohoo! So in reality, it's unclear how strong of an effect the last CD not being good would have on ticket sales for the live shows because they might still have a backlog of material that people like, but they're going to play them, you know, the majority of the shows can be that old material. But nonetheless, to some degree, if the new CD is terrible, that's probably going to result in some sort of decrease in demand for the live shows. I mean, let's be reasonable here. So what would end up happening if we were to draw a decrease in demand on these diagrams, we would get something, you know, I'm drawing this pretty conservatively, but we would get some sort of shift to the left. And obviously that decrease in demand, we said before that decreases in demand push prices down. 
So without even doing anything other than making their products suck, I suppose, they're actually serving to bring prices down. So if the, if the new CD was a dud, their concerns about people paying too much to, the, to go to the concerts probably not totally going to come to fruition because natural market forces are going to show them that, hey, maybe they should just lower ticket prices anyway. You could also put a decrease in demand on this diagram here, and you can see in either case that this is going to help alleviate the problem of prices being, as the artist put it, too high. And this is something that we actually see in practice. You know, you see artists that book particular venues and then you see their ticket sales not being particularly strong. I think Carly Rae Jepsen had this problem earlier in the year that she was booked at a very large venue and they'd only sold like 837 tickets or something like that. Now, what would happen just due to natural market forces if they were committed to staying in that venue is they would put the tickets on sale. And what you'll see in a lot of those cases is that even though they're not explicitly lowering the face value of the tickets, sometimes they'll offer two-for-one deals, sometimes they'll offer things through Groupon, stuff like that. They have ways of, in a practical sense, lowering the price in order to sell more of the tickets. You also see sometimes when rock stars aren't selling tickets the way that it was expected that they would, you see sometimes some canceling legs of the tours or moving to smaller venues, etc. And what's actually happening in those cases is that they're actually shifting supply to the left, right? They're decreasing supply. And what they're actually doing in those cases is they're decreasing supply in order to prop the price up, that they're doing that as an alternative to putting the tickets on sale. The last part of the problem reads, Suppose the group announced their next tour was going to be their last. So they're the Rolling Stones over and over and over again, I guess. What effect would this likely have on the demand and the price of tickets? Illustrate with the supply and demand diagram. So we can think about what factor of supply or demand or what determinant of supply or demand this scenario is really affecting. And it seems like it's really affecting demand because it's changing consumers' expectations, right? That if you thought that you wouldn't be able to get something tomorrow, that you would be more likely to purchase it today. So what we would see is that we would see an increase or a shift to the right in demand. So we could see on this graph it would look like this, and on this graph it would look like this here. And we can see that the market effect is going to be that it's going to push prices up. So if this particular artist was concerned about ticket prices being too high, or especially too high in secondary markets, they might want to keep their mouths shut about if it was actually going to be their last tour. In other words, they want to be the opposite of the Rolling Stones, who have kept saying basically every tour is their last tour, then the next one's their last one, and so on and so forth. Not surprisingly, the fact that a band would keep saying this is our last tour, it actually does keep the ticket price is pretty high because of the way that that information affects consumer expectations and hence their willingness to pay. You know, I remember the last time the Rolling Stones were in Boston, I seriously considered paying $1,000 for a standing room ticket in something called the Tongue Pit. And I probably wouldn't have really considered that if I thought that I would have another opportunity to go see them at a later point in time. So we can think about here how in a number of different ways, both on the supply side and on the side of setting consumer expectations and also by modifying the quality of their product, these artists are actually kind of in control of these market prices. But they're not in charge or they're not in control of those market prices because they can just decide what they should be. So what we saw is that this declaration of, I think the price should be $50, doesn't really work. The market forces just work to counteract that in various ways. It's very hard to just decree or state what a price should be. That said, there are a number of avenues that the artist or the producer has in order to modify the situation so that the market forces are working to achieve the ends that they were looking to accomplish.